Stephen and I met when we were in high school. We were actually at separate high schools, but we met when we were about 16 years old, and we had a mutual group of friends. We had a lot of similar interests. A lot of them might be classified as countercultural interests, and we were worried about the environment before it was cool to be green, and we were interested in alternative music and art. And so there was a pretty good culture of those things where we lived. And we had, Stephen would work on zines, and we would get literature from around the country, and we found some interesting books. And one of the books that influenced us most, I think, I don't know what you think, but that influenced us most was the $50 Underground House book. And I thought, oh, wow, it'd be super cool to not have a mortgage and not have to work 40 hours a week. We were both disillusioned with the whole go to college, get a job, get a mortgage, be a slave to the wage machine. So we were looking for alternatives to that. And it took a long time, a lot of trying and a lot of evolution and a lot of talking to people to realize more, well, more what we thought the, the issues and the problems were and what some of the potential solutions were. So when we were trying to figure out what culture was and what we thought was wrong with it and how to deal with it, we did a lot of traveling. When we were 17, we went on a bus trip around the country and talked to a lot of people and saw a lot of different cultures and things that were going on. And then we decided, okay, we're going to go on further, larger trips to other places and see what's going on in the broader world. So we went to Mexico, Stephen went to Japan, and we went to India for three months when we were 18 and 19. The traveling really brought home the idea that, to me at least, that happiness was more, you know, what you were doing, your community, hanging out with the people that you loved. And the people in India, you know, were a hundredth or a thousandth as wealthy as us here in America, but they didn't seem, in fact, most of them seemed happier than, than what we were doing here in the States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we decided that it didn't really matter what we had, but we wanted to shed a lot of the consumer culture that people complain about and see what it was like. Can we live in the woods on our own in a sustainable way? And so that was one of the primary things we wanted to do is see, can we build our own house out of recycled materials and materials we find really inexpensively and how cheaply can we live primarily. We eventually went back to college for about a year and a half. We went down to Austin and we were going to school at the University of Texas and then we ended up meeting lots of great people, not actually so much in the college but Austin in the early 90s was really happening uh, with all these different kinds of environmental and sustainability and bike activist people and uh, we kind of got caught up in, with all those people and started getting an idea of how to apply some of these more low-tech, independent-minded philosophies to our own lives. We came back to North Carolina and found 10 acres in the woods, really inexpensive land. and It was also extremely remote. And what we actually found was that for the very small amount of money we had, the best idea then was to live in a yurt. So we had a yurt for mm, about five years. It got really hot in the summertime, it got really cold in the winter. We had a wood stove, but it was never, in the spring and the fall it was pleasant, but the rest of the year it was pretty terrible. Well, so, that's because it was pleasant outside. If it was yeah. pleasant outside, it was pleasant <laughs> in New York. Yeah. <laughs> so that taught us a few things, one of which is that insulation is pretty important. <laughs> and, that, and then the yurt collapsed in a snowstorm in 2000, so we learned, okay, it's important to put a little heft into your structures and we have to worry a little bit more about the engineering with the next house we build. We still wanted to live in the country, and we were still kind of hung up on this country life thing. Um, but we wanted to rebuild out there, build something that would be a little more stable than the yurt and a little longer lived. So we discovered cob, which was basically like adobe, but you don't make bricks, but you build the walls when they're wet, and then they dry in place. We knew we wanted it to be as efficient as possible. And right around this time, 2000, was when we really started to think more about energy and energy efficiency. And we also learned about peak oil not so long thereafter. So it really influenced our thinking when we started to build the second house. Okay, we want it to be as energy efficient as possible, passive solar, active solar. You know, how can we integrate those things into the structure? We were also starting to understand um, the importance in energy, but also for any kind of independence locally that uh, you needed to use things locally and build things locally and to mm -hmm. also have an aesthetic to make things attractive and to make them look, you know, look good as opposed to just being a kind of cattywampus yurt that you know, collapses in a big snowstorm. Simultaneously to deciding to build the Cobb House, we we're also thinking about what we wanted to do career-wise and work on the house part-time and have jobs part-time. So Stephen started working as a restoration carpenter 
which was a very good choice of a career because there's a lot of old buildings in North Carolina and also because it gave him building skills which we had lacked severely <laughs> even though we decided to build our own house out in the country and you can tell if you go and look there you can see the evolution of our carpentry and wiring skills over the years. Whenever we would try and work on house projects together not so much the design of the house, but just the, a physical project where we would try and build something together, we would get in arguments. And Stephen would say, oh, you do it this way. And I would say, I don't want to listen to you. I'm going to do it my way. Or It just led to lots of arguments. I realized one day that it would be better if I had my projects and Stephen had his projects. And so he was starting to work as a restoration carpenter. He could do the carpentry. I don't really like doing carpentry. So he became the carpenter on the project. And that left me with the plumbing and the wiring. And I didn't especially want to do the plumbing and the wiring, but I thought, okay, I can do this. I'm going to learn all I can about plumbing and wiring. I'll take over this part of the project. And then it turned out that I actually really liked it. It's kind of a jigsaw puzzle, and it's pretty interesting, and there's 14 different ways to accomplish one task and all kinds of different materials. And um, so I did do most of the, all, I guess I did all of the plumbing in the house. And then I got to the electrical part, and it scared me a little bit because it can kill you dead, not just flood your house. And I read books, and I talked to people, and I really was just not progressing. I wasn't really getting anywhere on the wiring front um, because it scared me a little bit. So I thought, oh, I really need to learn a little bit more about this. Um, and I also wanted to have the house run off of solar electricity. So I started reading books about solar electricity and more books about wiring, and I would talk to friends. And the more I became educated about it, the more I started to like it. I liked it so much that I eventually decided to go to school to become an electrician, and specifically to become a solar electrician. Um, but the house work was prior to that, so it's not, it's not perfect, I would say. Um, but it was really educational, and it's interesting that the thing I was most scared of in the house is the thing that I now do for a living. I'm a licensed electrical contractor and a licensed solar installer, and I teach people all over the country how to design and install solar electric arrays. So it definitely, Stephen, it, just the, the act of house construction set Stephen off on his career path and me off on my career path as well. Our house got its certificate of occupancy. It was everything we had dreamed about when we were 18 years old. Here we are in the woods. And then comes peak oil. And we both started to read about peak oil. Basically, we had a realization that, OK, we built a really sustainable house, but it's not in a sustainable location. Even without any kind of peak oil or climate change thing, mm -hmm. I think we ended up feeling we would have felt very isolated and as if we had kind of gone down one road as far as we could. And so the decision was made to kind of turn around a little bit, go back down that road and, and kind of move into the city. When everybody talks about green building or sustainable building, a lot of it has historically been focused on how do you build a new green house. And we said, well, maybe you don't have to do that. Maybe we can move into the city. There's a lot of embodied energy in existing infrastructure. We can take one of those houses and make it green. The idea that just us doing this and m reducing our carbon footprint and using fewer fossil fuels didn't seem like it would have that much of an effect, honestly. So I felt, and also we had this desire to build community. So we, the idea of writing the book and, and teaching and educating and not just making it so it was something that we did in isolation, because that's what we had done before. We had done something in isolation. And here, part of moving into the town was to promote this idea that, hey, this is doable where we live, where we already, in the infrastructure that we already have, we can retrofit what we have. Mm -hmm. And here's how we did it. And not that you have to do it exactly like we did it, but here we are. We're taking a house that all everybody else is living in and making it happen right now. So to make the idea of this excuse. I, we meet so many people that say, oh, I just can't wait till you know I've saved up enough money and then I can go live off grid in the woods in a little straw bale house that I built. And Well, that's fine if you actually live and work and hang out in the woods all the time and you're commuting over there to the woods, then by all means go build a house there and make it so that you don't have to you know, drive back and forth to the woods. But if you're actually hanging out in the city and working in the city and doing things in the city, maybe you should think about doing things here where you are. Um, 
because that was a really important motivator for us also. Mm. And people make a lot of excuses when they have old houses that it's just, oh, it's too big a hurdle, I can't even get started, it's just never going to work. And so the book is project by project and saying you don't have to do everything all at once. You know, there's lots of steps you can take. Some of them are ridiculously easy, like switching out your light bulb. Some of them are harder, maybe putting on a new roof or doing rainwater catchment. But there's all these projects you can do to make basically any house you can make a net zero or energy efficient or fossil fuel free house if you put in a lot of time and effort. One of the other comments that Stephen and I hear a lot is also, oh, I can't do that because I don't have a ton of money and you have skills to do that. Steven's a carpenter, you're an electrician, you know, I don't have those skills, so what am I going to do? I don't have money, I don't have skills. And we didn't have these skills when we started. <laughs> it was a process of accumulation of learning over time. You know, we just had to start. You start building things and you do things wrong, and then you learn a little bit and you talk to people and you go back and start over. And people make a lot of excuses not to get started. The Carbon Free Home book is really quite focused on residences retrofitting specifically existing buildings, existing homes to be energy efficient. Although they do, it does have projects for people in apartments and mm -hmm. not and necessarily renters. that in renters. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to be a, a homeowner to, to use it. When we set up the book, we wanted to go through every aspect of the home and say, where can you reduce fossil energy use? Well, how can you make this activity carbon free? So we looked at each activity in the home. There was, you know, you want hot water in your home. You want to cook your food. You want to, you know, electricity. have electricity. You want to get around, you know. So we even took a, we knew that was an important aspect of it, the transportation aspect of it. You want water. So we, when we go from the for each we broke it down into those chapters into those different activities and we give you a really try to give you a really low tech hands on you know simple way to make an immediate impact but then also as the chapter progresses off, offer one or two more expensive options so that you can if you want to eliminate all your fossil energy use for that activity and then of course if you can go through the whole book and do that for all of your activity activities then you can eliminate all your your home fossil energy use and mm -hmm. be carbon free. We also in each chapter we also talk about our story what we decided to do and why we made this decision or that decision because there are a lot of decisions you can get an instantaneous water heater and some people call them on demand water heater you can use one of those and it'll reduce the energy you use for water heating by maybe 30 to 50 percent. Um, or you can get a solar water heater. Or you can heat up water on your wood stove. There's lots of different things that you can do if you're trying to reduce the amount of fossil fuels that you put into heating water. So we'll talk about what we've done over the course of the years. You can have a solar shower outside in the summertime. That's another good option. So it's not like there's only one answer and we did it and you have to do it this way. You can go out and you can experiment and like Stephen said, there's low tech ways, there's high tech ways, there's cheap ways, there's expensive ways and you just have to start trying. We want to emphasize the idea that you can do a little bit and it still makes a difference. It's still very important to do that. Activities in your home aren't just turning on the lights. It's, you know, what food you eat, do you walk down to see a movie or do you get in your car to see a movie? All those things are integrated with the way you live. Are you catching rainwater or are you using water that's gone through a city purification system? And in a municipality, about 50% of the energy consumed by your municipality goes to purifying water and wastewater treatment. And that is energy you're using in your home, whether you know it or not. So there's a lot of bigger picture things out there that people can forget about. And all of those things are going to make an impact if what you're trying to do is use less fossil fuels, whether it's because of they're getting more expensive or because you're worried about climate disruption. There's a lot of reasons to use fewer fossil fuels. And you are part of your community. So all of those things are going to make a difference, not just slapping a few solar panels on your roof and saying, okay, now I'm net zero. I've zeroed out my electric bill. Everything's good. I don't have to worry about anything anymore. We have a book, A Solar Buyer's Guide for Home and Office, which is meant to be a guide to learning about all your solar options, whether it's solar hot water or solar air heating or solar electricity. If you've got a good site for any of those technologies, what they cost, what the federal and state incentives might be, um, how to find a good installer if you're not going to do a DIY project. And what prompted us to write this book is that is what I do for a living is install solar, mainly solar electric, but also solar thermal and solar hot air. 
and I also teach solar design and installation classes around the country. And both Stephen and I end up talking to schools and homeowners associations and church groups about energy efficiency and retrofits. And what happens is a lot of times the conversations get very sidetracked into solar because people are really curious about it and you hear a lot about it. But there's also a lot of confusion out there about solar. And many, many people we talk to don't know there's a difference between solar hot water panels and solar electric panels. and so we just want to make sure that people have the information they need as it gets more and more popular and you see it more places to decide, you know, is this the right technology for me? Do I want to put it on my home or my office? How do I make sure the person that is installing it is qualified to install it? Because a lot of these, specifically solar electric systems, are pretty complicated and if you don't do them right, they can be dangerous, um, they might not work very well, and they're also really expensive, solar electricity specifically. Yeah, and we want to let people understand how the different solar technologies have different energy returns on them mm -hmm. and different levels of complexity. So solar thermal, for example, w what we mean by that is turning solar energy into heat, and most often that's done for hot water. Uh, it can be four times as efficient as turning solar energy into electricity because uh, it's just a much simpler process to obviously turn solar energy into heat. So we break those down uh, and go through all the incentives and let folks understand from their own financial and solar window viewpoint what makes sense for, for their specific location. The Solar Buyer's Guide is more for existing or planned residences, small offices, commercial buildings, farms, not utility scale solar so much, although it's not all that different than residential scale solar, but solar is really modular. So it's pretty easy to scale systems up or scale them down. Um, and then there's tax credits for residential or commercial, slightly different tax credits and slightly different incentives um, and slightly different pricing structures. It's definitely a good introduction to all the different solar options and an introduction to dealing with installers, which will mm -hmm. be the same on a residential office commercial scale and understand, starting to understand all the different incentives. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes through in detail, you know, good introduction to all of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's funny because I, I love solar. It's what I do for a living and I talk about it all the time. As Stephen can vouch for, I spend way too much time talking about solar. But it also bugs me a little bit because, as everybody says, oh, solar is sexy, specifically solar electricity, and it's what everybody wants to talk about, but there's so many other things you can do for energy efficiency that have nothing to do with putting solar electric panels on your roof, and that gets lost in the conversation. So, Yeah, first you should try to reduce your consumption and yeah. then provide what you do consume with renewable resources. There's nowhere in the United States that is not, does not have a great solar resource. But there's lots of places in the United States that don't have a good wind resource or a good microhydro resource if you're talking specifically about renewable electricity. How do I make electricity from renewable resources? Those are your three main options here on a residential or small commercial scale or solar electricity, um, wind turbines, or microhydro. And solar is the only one that can be put anywhere in the country as long as you have a wide open solar window. And it can be very tiny, it can be medium sized, it can be very large. So it's just incredibly flexible in that aspect. But then solar has this advantage that it can provide heat right where it's needed in your home. And that's mm -hmm. totally underutilized mm -hmm. for hot water and for home heating. Mm -hmm. So in that, it is definitely unique. And so our book tries to analyze all those options in one go and not think about just electricity. Mm -hmm. Think about all the different ways that you can use solar energy. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily the least expensive way to get electricity. You can buy electricity from the fossil fuel plant that's taken tops off of mountains in West Virginia. Um, lots of times microhydro is going to be a less expensive way to get renewable electricity than photovoltaic panels, but it, many, many, many places you can't use a microhydro turbine. It's just solar you can put pretty much anywhere. But you can buy, you know, if you do live near a large wind resource, you can mm -hmm. oftentimes buy green tags or, or green credits through your electrical company. And that's often a, a fabulous way to, 
get renewable electricity into your home by, mm -hmm. sub by subsidizing that on a, on a large scale. So that's mm -hmm. definitely something to think about as you analyze your renewable electricity options. Mm -hmm. And 99% of the systems that I design and install now are interconnected with the utility grid, meaning the wires running down the street that go over to your whoever your, your utility provider is. And that is a very new thing in the United States. It's only been about 10 years, barely 10 years, that that's been going on in the United States. It's been going on longer in Europe. But 10 years, we've had solar electric that you can feed back power to the grid, and then it'll go into your neighbor's house, whether they know it or not. So that's a very new thing. It used to be that all the solar electric systems were off-grid, standalone systems. And so that has been a paradigm shift in solar electricity. Um, it really has changed the way that people build and design systems. It changes the efficiency and the cost and a whole host of things. Mm -hmm. And that is the main reason that solar electricity has exploded in popularity now is because it doesn't have to be a little awkward system. You can build a system, put it anywhere, and spin your meter backwards all over the country now. So it really, that's why we're seeing so much more solar electricity is this ability to feed back into the power grid. The country with the most installed solar electricity right now is Germany, and a lot of people have heard about that. Oh, there's solar panels all over the place in Germany. If you're a solar installer, what you talk about is something called peak sun hours, and that is the average amount of good sun you get per day on a year-round basis. Where we live in North Carolina, we get on average five peak sun hours a day. That includes rainy days and cloudy days and everything all combined. We just say on average you get about five really good solid peak sun hours. In Germany, the average is about three and a half, a little more than three and a half, 3.5. But Germany has 10 times more solar electricity installed than the entire United States. And the reason is not because they have more sun. Obviously, they don't have more sun. What they do have is better public policy that incentivizes solar electric installations. And what happens is, if you put a solar electric panel in Germany, it might, over the course of a year, produce slightly less electricity than if you had put it in North Carolina, but it's still going to work fine. It might produce 15 or 20 percent less electricity cumulatively, but it's still going to work great whenever the sun is shining. So that might affect the efficiency of the system a little bit, but it still is going to be a perfectly functioning system. And so what you see is that every single place in the continental United States has more peak sun hours than Germany. Every single place. Washington State, Vermont, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, everywhere has more sun than Germany. So obviously there's no reason for us not to be installing solar electricity here if it works great in Germany. Germany has something called a feed-in tariff. Anyone who's producing solar electricity gets paid a little bit more per kilowatt hour. And we're seeing that happen in some places in the United States, but right now there's really a mishmash of incentives. You've got a federal tax credit, and then on the state level you might have rebates or tax credits some places have feed-in tariffs where you get paid for what you produce. You get a little more cents per kilowatt hour. You'll also see some really cool new things coming down the pipeline where you've got community-supported clean energy where you can get loans from your community to put solar in. And you might have systems that are financed by the installation company, so there's zero dollars down up front. And like I said, you know, it's only been 10 years that we've had interconnected systems in the United States, and it's been they're going up the bell curve, so we're seeing more and more, and as it happens, there's more creative ways for people to get solar on their house or business. That's definitely one of the reasons we wanted to write the solar book, is to go into all these different financing options and make sure that folks understand, oh, there are not only are there all these different ways to use solar energy, whether it's solar thermal or solar electricity, but there's also all these different options when it comes to solar electricity for financing and even sometimes you don't even have to pay anything up front and then you can just get the solar electricity panels installed and then you have a reduction of your electric bill and it's an amazing thing. The book that we have coming out, The Solar Buyer's Guide for Home and Office, the subtitle is Navigating the Maze of Solar Options, Incentives and Installers and the idea is just that. So we want to go through, your, first of all, you're going to buy a system. You're not going to install it yourself because, honestly, lots of solar equipment, most solar equipment is very difficult to install. Not all of it, but solar, so there's some solar heating options you can do yourself. But in general, it's difficult to install, and you're probably going to be hiring someone if you're interested in buying something solar to do this. Mm -hmm. So we want you to get first of all to the point where you understand all of the different options that what all that solar can do and as we mentioned before it's a little bit more than something wind or microhydro solar can heat things up 
heat your house, heat your hot water, and provide electricity. So go through all those options. Go through how you understand all this amazing array of finan financing options that have become available. So there's solar installers that are lending money. There's you know banks that are lend have green loans. There's tax credits on the federal and the state level. There's feed-in tariffs and there's so many different ways that these are now being financed and some of them these options are available only state by state sometimes only in certain municipalities but sometimes they're available throughout the nation so we want you to understand all those so that you can get this system as cheap as possible and sometimes you don't have to pay at all which can be a fabulous thing mm -hmm. and then also to let you know that there has been a little bit of a solar boom going on. There's a lot of installers getting into this business and not all of them are going to do a good job. As, you know, I wish that it, that wasn't the case, but there is definitely a solar installer boom going on as well. And we, you need to proceed with a little bit of caution when you're hiring a, a solar installer and make sure that you're getting a reputable one and that you get a good job and get a good deal for your money. When I first got interested in solar electricity, it was to put it on our own off-grid house, and it was in the early part of the 2000s, and really there wasn't much utility-connected solar then, especially where we lived in North Carolina. There were maybe two systems in the whole state that were connected to the grid. So everybody was focused on off-grid, and that's where I started learning um, battery-based systems, things like that. And then as we've seen more interconnected systems go in, at first I went to school for electrical technology because I thought, okay, this is an electrical system. I need to know how electricity works, how to wire a house, how to make sure I have safe overcurrent protection, disconnects, and that it's code compliant. There's a national electric code, and the system's going to be inspected and has to adhere to the 700 pages of the national <laughs> electric code. And then I went to work for an electrician who was licensed, and he was specifically doing solar. That was his interest, so it was a good fit for me because I wanted to become an electrician in order to do solar installations. So I got my journeyman hours underneath this solar, working under as an apprentice to this solar installing electrician. And I also went to solar school at Solar Energy International in Colorado, which is a nonprofit renewable energy educator that's been doing solar classes for 20 years. Um, and what I've seen is that I teach classes now around the country, and what happened is the economy collapsed, people were looking for new jobs, whether they were contractors or construction workers or builders or real estate agents, and they thought, hey, what's the new next boom? And it's solar. <laughs> so that's where a lot of jobs are, but it means there's a lot of people just slapping a big picture of a sun on their truck and calling themselves a solar installer. And so in the book we go through, okay, is, do they have an electrical license? What are the state requirements? What are the rebate requirements? Different rebate programs are going to mandate that your installer has certain amounts of experience. Um, there's a national board of certified energy practitioners called NABCEP, so you'll see NABCEP certification on most high-quality solar installers are going to have someone who's NABCEP certified within the company. Both of us are super excited that there's so much more solar going on out in the world. Big projects and little projects, you see it a lot more places than you used to. But it's also a little bit worrisome because we want to make sure that the systems going in are effective and efficient and don't cost too much and that they're well installed and that there's informed consumers out there. So, Yeah, there seems to have been a, a much larger focus on solar electricity and a lot of the incentives there. So it's important to analyze the whole, your whole solar options and, uh, all at once, we think. So that's what the book attempts to do. Mm -hmm.